Hi, I'm Stephanie Christbaum, and I'm here to read a small excerpt from my book toward a new rhetoric of difference. The bit that I'm going to read is taken from chapter two. I'm deaf. I'm also a white female. I wear glasses, and I grew up outside Cleveland, Ohio. One could perhaps say that these are relatively static features of my identity. I wear glasses almost every waking hour. I've never not been white or female. I was born deaf, and I cannot change where I grew up. But at the same time, none of these features have a stable meaning. As I move in and out of different contexts, some of them matter more at some times and less at others and they take on different shades of meaning and nuance, depending on who I am interacting with. That I wear glasses is inconsequential in most interactions, while the fact that I'm deaf matters significantly more often. But how these things matter is highly variable. Knowing these things about me will not tell you what you need to do when you meet me, nor what adaptations you might make as you communicate with me. Knowing these things also doesn't determine how you will work with me as a student, nor how I manage in front of the classroom as a teacher. If you too are deaf, or if you've worked or lived with other deaf people, or if you've ever met a deaf person, or if you've read research by or about deaf people, or if you've seen representations of deaf people in popular media, you might be able to form some hypotheses about what I do in the classroom to accommodate my deafness. And the more experience you have with deaf people, the more you will likely come to realize the variation within that category, and the more you'll realize that you can't know. Without meeting me, talking to me, or interacting with me in some way, exactly how my deafness matters and when it matters. When you meet me, you might find that I fit a lot of your predictions or assumptions about deaf people, and that many of your predictions were accurate. But you might also find that I challenge or resist some of your expectations. It's awkward for me when I encounter someone who ignores or just does not understand my cues about how best to communicate with me, whether I communicate these cues indirectly such as by moving so I can see someone's face, or by making direct requests, such as please talk to me, not the interpreter. When these scenarios happen, I have to decide whether I'm going to openly engage, whether I'll play along, or whether I'll simply try to educate myself from the situation. For this reason, I find myself strongly disagreeing with Anne Jurisic, when she said that when teachers meet autistic students, they should know not only, quote, what that means, but what to do, unquote. I read this claim largely because it is not true for me and the way that I prefer to approach me, but also because emphasizing what we know or should know leaves scant room for students and teachers to co-construct knowledge about why men to work together in the classroom. There's a real gap between what we think we know about types of students, pedagogy, and what works, and the interactions we have in our classrooms that bring differences of all kinds alive. To shift the emphasis toward ways of learning with our students rather than about them, I suggest we might benefit from paying close attention to how differences take shape within classroom interaction. From such a perspective, difference is not presentable through categories or static across time and space. Instead, it is dynamic, it is relational, and it is emergent in interaction. Teachers cannot study difference and respond to it by cataloging or even predicting all the potential differences that might affect their classroom or pedagogy. So what might happen if we learn to listen? as Catherine Schultz and Krista Ratcliffe have each urged us to do, to difference as it takes shape while people learn and write in a wide variety of social contexts. Thank you.